Things are going to start happening to me now. You've done all the reading. You're a scholar. You're a professor. You've done all the reading. You've done the intellectual heavy lifting. More or less, he shouldn't die. You wouldn't know a fact if it begged you all night long. Want to like, um, you know, give the wrong impression because I am, I I am very high. Can ran up behind him with a hatchet. Smash, smash, smash. Yeah, I care. I'm a libertarian. What I'm getting is, did why? you vote for Joe Jorgensen or Trump? Who? That's Joe the, Jorgensen. That was the perfect answer. Thank you. <laughs> that was and welcome everybody to the Libertarian Podcast Review. This is a different show we're going to do. You normally we we don't go off the rails so much, but we have look. Uh, just last week, I with Clint Russell, we talked about. The, the breakdown, the mental breakdown of our one and only, um, what's his name, Pendulet, okay? He's heroes out there. Well, if you have a hero, so maybe Scott Horton is your hero, maybe Andy's your hero. We're gonna say, don't glob onto heroes, they may lead you wrong. Scott Horton, welcome to the Libertarian Podcast Review. I, I appreciate you coming on, and, and Andy, of course, as well. Yeah, happy to be here. So, first of all, Scott Horton, you are the director of the Libertarian Institute, the editorial director of antiwar.com, a host of other things. Uh, Andy, uh, do, what are you? Uh, a garbage man. <laughs> okay. Do you have any books coming out? I know that uh, Scott has, has some books. Scott, maybe you can talk, talk to us real quick about your Libertarian books uh, and, and what you do at the Libertarian Institute. Before we get into the main topic, which is we're going to talk about skateboards, um, we're going to first, I'm going to play you with some clips and I want you to react to them. But first of all, tell us exactly what you do and uh, why you are uh, the legend that you are. Oh, well, I don't know about that, but uh, I uh, do a show. I got uh, 5,000 something interviews going back to 2003, uh, almost all libertarian anti war stuff. And then um, I wrote some books. I wrote Fool's Errand about Afghanistan and enough already about the war on terrorism, which. That's the best I can do is enough already if anybody wants to read that. And then um, I got a couple more. One of them is a collection of my interviews with Ron Paul. And then the new one is a collection of interviews that I did with different experts about nuclear weapons uh, over the last like 15 years or so. It really covers all aspects of nuclear weapons called Hotter Than the Sun. And um, I'm on the radio in Los Angeles on Sunday mornings. And I do a podcast at Scott Horton's show. Everybody can sign up for the feed there. And then I'm the director of the Libertarian Institute, which is a great group of guys and one gal so far. Uh, a lot of great writers and podcasters, basically. Um, and we publish books, um, including we just published a great one by Keith Knight that's called The Voluntarist Handbook, a collection of great an uh, great anarchist writings. And uh, uh, oh, and I'm the editorial director of antiwar.com. Last but not least, antiwar.com, which is really the most important project on the internet even though the front page looks like it was made in 2004, which is true. Um, it's, <laughs> that, that uh, late. It, okay, I was thinking earlier than that, but yes. Yeah, we, we got all the bad news for you every day. We got, you know, the great Dave DeCamp and Jason Ditz uh, writing up the news and really along with uh, Connor and Kyle, uh, Connor Freeman and Kyle Anzalone as well, writing up the news and uh, picking out all the viewpoints for you every day. We, and our, our stable of in-house writers other than uh, our fearless leader, Justin Romando, who's been dead for three years now, uh, is other than that, um, it's as good as it's ever been with Ramsey Baroud and Ray McGovern and Ted Carpenter and Doug Bondo, who are the two best guys at Cato, and uh, Ted Snyder, who's this great analyst from Canada and all these great people. So um, that's all the bad news. That's the most important thing. That's what I should have said first, antiwar.com. Uh, well, yeah, your your um, your apology is taken if that's what you're doing. Uh, I will say uh, so. Mostly, what I do is uh, I, I kind of review podcasts, libertarian issue adjacent, adjacent, do some interviews. Uh, I'm, I've said for a long time your interview show is some of the best, Scott Horton. I mean, you're great, and when you go on shows and you, you pontificate, but um, there's something about the way you're able to interview people and and intersperse your information. Uh, so just so you know, I, I I listen to that and I keep going back and back in the catalog. So it's a it's a great, great resource. Thanks. Yeah, uh, Andy, your show is is fantastic as well. And once again, <laughs> <laughs> hey, I've got I'm gonna try to do more. I've got. Um, Connor, no authority on Twitter. He's a younger guy at Mises Institute. He just put out an, uh, an article about landfill economics, which I'm really interested to talk about because 
I'm at oh, the landfill. Cool. Wow. <laughs> I didn't know yeah. you had your own show, Andy. Well, I just kind of stream when I want to on Odyssey, but you know, I want to start doing more with it. We'll see where it goes. I don't really have a schedule or anything, but I was about to sign up for the podcast feed too soon. Too soon. Too soon. Okay. Uh, <laughs> well, but I'll tell you what you can do is um, uh, once a month, Andy and I get together and we we rip off uh, Tony Hinchcliffe and his Kill Tony. Okay. He does a thing there in Austin where you're at. And uh, comics come in. They have amateurs. They have a minute to go up there and they just say whatever they want. And then he rips on them. So Andy and I bring people in. They can say whatever they want for a minute. And then we have a conversation with them and, and kind of filter people through as best we can uh, this method. So Scott. In, in that vein, I'm going to play you some clips here, okay? I've got three clips, somewhat short. Uh, these are actually political-related, and if I if I didn't talk to you a little bit about politics, I'd be really remiss. So um, the first one here, this is a recent interview of uh, – whoops, let's see if I could figure this out here. There we go. Um, Michael Malice had on uh, Charlie Kirk, and they talked about uh, weed, and so since – um, we're talking skateboarding, and um, I've heard that for, through the rumor mill other things. I thought this would be a perfect one for you guys. Okay, let's go. I said earlier that you have become more conservative and less yes. as you've gotten older uh, in your old age. Uh, how have you yes. become? Can you give me a few examples or one? Even? Yeah, I mean, I'll give you one, and I mean, you're gonna, you're probably gonna totally disagree, and I, that's fine. Is that I used to be super libertarian on weed, right? And like, oh yeah, do whatever you want. And I'm the exact opposite now. I think it. I've seen it destroy people's lives, like actually destroy people's lives. Um, I've seen it create in remarkably violent tendencies. Now, I'm not trying to judge if some of your audience does it. That's not my point. My point is, should we go out of our way to evangelistically legalize a substance when we already have substance abuse is widespread? That's the question. I understand the alcohol contradiction argument. I can address that. But I, for example, I live in Scottsdale. They're building a marijuana dispensary five, five minutes from my home. I do not want the people that go to marijuana dispensaries at 1 a.m. near my home. I don't. And local government, I don't want you near me, period. And so... I've seen it in Denver. I've seen it in my home of Chicago. I've seen it in Vegas. I think it creates a sloppiness to the society. And by the way, I'll just be very honest. I hate the smell of it. Um, and I also have seen it personally just completely and totally obliterate people's personal ambitions. And I think the stereotype that it is a gateway drug is kind of true. So that's just one way. Um, a second one. In that though, Because one of the issues that I think you and I would very much agree on is the problem with drug cartels. Right. Oh, and, I totally agree. But it hasn't made them weaker. It's made them stronger since we've legalized. Like so the you, Sinola cartel is stronger than ever since we've legalized weed. So you, so is in your opinion that marijuana was a nationwide, nation, excuse me, nationwide uh, made in something equivalent to like what is a substance, a schedule, whatever uh, drug that this would be uh, would hurt the cartels? I don't – maybe. I mean, I think that – look, my, my view actually ends up being more moderate, which is it doesn't need to be overly enforced. I just don't think we should have dispensaries in every corner. Like, I get it if some kid does dope, I suppose, but it is the culture of weed that comes in that just drives me crazy. But I guess to, just to counter the argument, the cartels were weaker when we used to actually enforce these laws. The cartels are stronger than ever, period. They're richer than ever. God damn. How long does this go on? Uh, we'll stop it right there. There's my rant is how fucking dare you make me sit here and listen to this for more than 60 seconds in a row. Well, I, 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 that, that was the long one, but I had to get to because I needed you to hear him that he doesn't like the smell. I needed to the, the weed in the cartels and that he lives in Arizona. So he's a, an expert. Um, this one made me laugh. So, Scott, I don't, keep it to a minute if you can. But and Andy, you can chime in on this, too. Well, I mean, thank goodness a big truck drove by and it muted out about 15, 20 seconds of that. It's going really slow. It might have been a garbage truck. Um, so I didn't have to hear all of it. But look, no, the whole thing is stupid. We shouldn't go around evangelically legalizing it. OK, well, that's just completely stupid. That doesn't even mean anything. We should make it legal or we should keep it a crime. It has nothing to do with being evangelical about people using it at all, which is, of course, an entirely different question. He doesn't address at all whether people should have to go to jail for this. Other than like, what does he say? Some, I guess if a kid smokes dope, then OK. What does that mean? It either should be legal or it shouldn't be legal for somebody to smoke dope. They should be arrested. They should have their car searched. They should have to piss in a cup and go to classes and be on probation and maybe go to prison. You know, I saw one the other day. Did you see on Twitter, a guy's doing life for pot. Hmm. And people said, no, uh, look at his record. It was but like 46 what grams. What happened was he had committed a burglary and then he got busted for possession of a firearm. And then he got busted for possession of an ounce of pot. Not a pound, not a ton, 
an ounce of pot. And so he got life in prison in the United States of America. Life in prison. And I'll bet the DA brought the, the pot as kind of an enhancer to, you know, make them uh, negotiate, make take a plea deal. Perhaps, I'm guessing, perhaps. Well, no, that was the actually the thing was he, he, decided he to push it. tried to get a jury trial because he thought it wasn't right. fair. And then they admonished him and bragged that that's what you get for asking for a trial, right. you know, which is supposed to be your right. But that's known as the trial enhancement that, you what? know, for daring to put them uh, to the test and to prove their case against you. What, what do you so, think about well, his argument for the cartels? Does this, does this moron have anything coherent no. to say about whether the state should have the authority to kidnap and cage people for having and trading this or not? Instead, what do you get? When it annoys me that what that <laughs> Mexicans are in the neighborhood at right. the pot store. <clears throat> well. I mean, even then is because of the whole regulatory regime of the dispensaries and this and that. If you could just buy it wherever, you wouldn't have a problem of a bunch of people all lining up in one place to buy weed at some boutique weird thing. Which have, is you, have you heard anything about cartels? And by the way, I don't know that cartels. Yes, are... I have. Of course, the cartels had to get out of the weed business right. and, and switch to methamphetamines and all That's this probably because why they're, they're competing against open market illegal. farmers. Yeah. Right. How can they possibly compete? When right. you have it growing in fields all across the United States of America. When I was a kid, all we smoked was Mexican dirt weed. As soon as they legalized it in California, that was it. At first, they called it kind bud. Ooh, it's kind bud. Then it was just bud. And the Mexican dirt weed that we used to smoke is absolutely, you can't even find it anywhere. There is no such thing as a $20 bag of brick CD dirt weed like it used to be. It's just gone. It's all grown above board and then you know, sold in the black markets too because right. some states are illegal and some aren't. Right. But the power of the criminal cartels in Mexico, it may have increased, but only in the most general sense that, yeah, time has gone on. I don't know, maybe the CIA gave them more money and guns, <laughs> but as far as growing pot, no. In fact, the Mexican cartels outright complain. You can read it at Reason Magazine outright complain legal pot has bankrupted and destroyed their business they've had to go into meth and into human trafficking and other things to make up their margins so this idiot he just has no idea what he's talking about he's just getting up there talking which is what right wingers do when it comes to things that they don't like oh yeah things that i don't like i think they should be a crime because i don't like them when and does he have a coherent argument about it whatsoever no i don't like the smell yeah Wait, so just what just wait till you hear the next Pathetic. bit. And Andy, do you have any uh, comments? And are you distributing weed in your truck? <laughs> no, but that'd probably be a good idea. Um, well, no, you, you know, I got into. <laughs> no, you know, I got into it with Michael Knowles over the weekend about this same that's thing. Right, he that's said, right. He that said that awesome. uh, the war on drugs is act was actually uh, loosened. They loosened the laws on drugs, and that's what made it worse. And I think there is an argument to be made maybe that progressive states that do legalize it, do it in the worst way possible. Um, you know, you're either dealing with black market cartels or state regulatory cartels, which are both criminal, if you ask me. And but when the taxes are high enough, you leave it, the mark, you leave room open for the black market. So you do still have yeah. some cartels and like mafia types trying to control pot because there's still room for that price differential in the black market. All right, I want yeah, to get to, to skateboarding stuff. So leave it open sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry I interrupted you, though. I just no, want to, Andy's I think there's a critique of conservatives or of the right, yeah. from the right on this issue. They yeah. claim to be small government, and this is one area where they really want to expand, and they should be called out on for yeah, it. I don't think it's I mean, really a conservative position to take to expand the drug war. And look, originally I mean, started by, Prohibition was originally started by progressives. And how many right. just, you know, innocent little old ladies got framed up by cops in the last, I don't know, 70 years over this on the side of the road. More than 10, more than a few hundred. How and many susceptible collateral damage for that? Or how many kids, remember the kid, well, this is a few years ago, I know there must be a million of them, where the kid's sitting in his car smoking a joint and the cops creep up on him and startle him. He puts it in reverse and then they just blow him away. 14-year-old kid, you know, or, or yeah. 16-year-old kid or whatever. You know, and it really and contradicts the their pre-tech. position. How many how many people got stopped because the cop just pretended that he smelled pot? Oh, I smell pot. <laughs> right. And now he has a license to do anything he wants. Go yep. into a club, uh, go into a bar, go into a business, go into a home. 
Yeah. How many people got framed up and falsely accused by informants? That's the guy that sold me weed. All right. Now don't give me 20 years. Give it to him instead. They said over. And it was a lie or even it was true. And then these guys got shot and killed. I mean, people have no idea the level of chaos that's brought to people's lives over the criminalization of pot, which what a fully like 10% of the population participates in regularly one way or another. Um, and then, but some people got to go to prison. You got people doing life in prison in some states while you have billionaires making money in these giant investment firms and, and, and all of this in others in the state next door. Uh, you got people doing federal time doing decades. Um, okay. We're going to play another clip here. Cause I'm, and then I'm wait, I'm sorry. Cause there was one more yeah. thing he said that I was going to address, but now I'm spacing out what it was. Cause I'm kind of high and I, it is bad for me. Oh, and that was Perfect. the thing. Yes, it is bad for your short term memory, but it makes people <laughs> violent. Oh, and also it makes no. people lazy. Oh, and also it makes people do other drugs too, right? This is all just a bunch of crap. There's, he has nothing to actually say here. This is just sloganeering, the same kind of slogans that you've heard for decades. Well, it, Scott, it he, may have just watched, he may have just watched Reefer Madness and he's just catching up. Okay, let's go to this next one here. Uh, hang on for this one. I'll be honest, just kind of more generally about libertarianism, and I don't mean this as an accusation or any of your listeners or all that. I think some parts of libertarianism are far too focused on abstractions, like way too focused on. Like I've read all the books, okay? I read Rothbard, I read Mises, I read Bastiat, I read Friedman, I read Rand. I mean, I could quote a lot of it. I understand it deeply. And then I realized that <laughs> really? a lot of it is just very idealistic built for academic arguments. It could be helpful and instructive at times, but it's, it's not, it's not, I don't believe it's a governing principle or a way to live your life at all. But you, I mean, you don't think this country was like the founding fathers were basically libertarian in their principle? No, of course not. No okay. way. No, I mean, no, like what Thomas right Jefferson away. was talking against sodomy laws in Virginia, <laughs> uh, in favor of sodomy laws in Virginia, that's not libertarian. Like they had state run religions. <laughs> Like, that's not libertarian. The national government might be libertarian. And I'll be very clear, like, I would love to live in a country where everyone, like, it was live and let live. And I think that's idealistically nice, but there's one gun on the table, right? And so there's three ways this ends up. We can all live in a free society where we all treat each other well. That's not going to happen, okay? Or they have the gun or we have the gun. Okay. Um, and before we go, Scott, I'm going to play one last one here, and then we're done on this ridiculous stuff, and we'll uh, enjoy uh, things a little bit better. This was a Penn Jillette. It's, it's a very, very short clip. It's 10, 15 seconds. Man. Libertarianism has been so distorted. I can see arguments for not wearing seatbelts, and I can see arguments for not wearing motorcycle helmets, but I cannot see any argument for driving drunk. And that is what not wearing a mask is. It's not risking yourself. It's risking the people around you. Okay. Uh, do you want to make any comments of those, or should we just... I feel like I just broke your brain or should we just go straight to skateboarding? Well, uh, look, no, I mean, I'll argue with right wingers. I mean, the thing of it is this. He says, oh, there's one gun, the state. So either they are going to control the left or we are the right. But he doesn't explain in any way why you wouldn't have libertarians holding the gun to right. prevent the right or the left from preventing people from living and letting live. He doesn't say. He goes, and he, and, and it's just, he, does he even claim he implies that libertarians think that what anyone should be allowed to do anything to them? Is that anyone's definition of libertarianism? When yes. actually, wait a minute, everyone knows that libertarians are more well-armed even than right-wingers, that libertarians are even, you know, what you'd call gun nuts. They're the first one. They're the last ones whose house you'd break into, uh, even in on a block full of right wingers. So is it really the case that libertarians, it, it, it makes no sense that it, or, or, or to him, he's saying it makes no sense that anything can hold off the left other than the right. But then yep. what's his answer? Pass laws preventing people from just living their own life, their own way, like getting high even if he doesn't want to that's wow. why I don't, you sure are I don't, winning the culture war dude <laughs> you I'm, know? I'm pretty i'm pretty hop appealed on this this is why i don't really consider charlie kirk a right winger because he's wanting to expand the government yeah no look i mean you could just if 
I don't know. I haven't read enough Hoppe to know if he like is so tiresome as to just pretend that the right wing means anti-government when it's not. Right. You just heard it out of the right winger's mouth. The right wing means the government in the hands of the forces of reaction against the forces of so-called progress, which leaves libertarians lost, stuck in the middle between these two complete idiocies. Hoppe's critique, critique I mean, of the right say, is oh, pretty no, good. Now Charlie Kirk is some kind of socialist. Yeah. I mean, whatever. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it doesn't it doesn't pack the punch. That's but not true, it's, really, right? It's not true. It's not like he was saying, yeah, no. What we need is to tax rich people more and give it to the poor people more and let them have more of a say over the way things are done. And that's not what he believes. He's a right winger by definition. And between left and right, libertarianism is not on there. Between left and right is between essentially, you know, communism on the left and national socialism on the right. You know, which is fascism on the right and in between there somewhere is moderation the center right and the center left republicans and democrats and then we the libertarians are the solution to all of what's wrong with all of this right because so they that, are wrong by the, about way, by the way that's that's virtually the, the, everything that's the argument to pen here and 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 nick says he skips a step of needing to be sick in order to spread sickness i think that's the problem <laughs> pen has <laughs> with his thing is we do actually have the, the the best arguments uh and pen seems to i don't know what happened his brain got melted as well well and look i think and i don't know when that's from like possibly that's Recently. extremely early in the thing or i don't know maybe he realized that actually masks weren't really making a difference at all or what i mean it became pretty clear pretty quickly i think that it took the kn95 like you know super surgical masks mm -hmm. to make any difference at all and that everybody running around in cloth masks and surgical masks wasn't doing anything so even if it was ebola being passed around <laughs> you know you might as well just be wearing a bandana or what it's right. not gonna it'll prevent the biggest you know if i got covid you know alpha and I'm like flex of spittle or flying out of my mouth into yours. Like you might prefer not, <laughs> you know what I mean? But, but as far as the little aerosolized particles, uh, those kinds of masks are going to make any difference whatsoever. But I think, you know, people want to believe government's good for something in an emergency like this, you know, what can they do? But it, you know, from the very beginning of this thing, by definition, it's a respiratory virus. Folks are going to cough. It's going to get around. You know, I still haven't like, gotten it. I'm yeah, not for you to get Ebola, it. Yeah, for you to get Ebola, you got to have a real high fever already and be essentially in direct contact with people. That's why it's easy to contain. It's not a respiratory virus. But if Ebola was a respiratory virus, humanity would just lay down and die, most of us. And it would we there'd be no amount of mask mandates that would do anything about that. And then, so Pendulet, I guess, is like, you know, he, he stuck with his conclusion first. He wants for this public health kind of crisis yes. management to kick in. And then he realizes that libertarianism doesn't allow for it. So he says, well, screw libertarianism then. Yep. But then in 2022, I mean, come on. There's no question about who had the right take on all of that stuff. And all the libertarians who were way out in front and were considered wingnuts are the ones who get all the credit now. Well, Scott, that's what's uh, and, and don't watch the his interview. That's what's frustrating is that's a quote before the interview, like he did a few months ago, and then he doesn't really wane off of that whole process um, going forward. Okay, for, dude. For anybody and still watching, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you kudos here, Scott. To me, I've never seen Tim Pool skate in person, but as far as I'm concerned, I've seen videos of him skate. You're still better than he is, no matter what amount of flat flat ground pair of wheels or flippy dippy. I am better than him. <laughs> Good, good to um, hear. Uh, last thing I'm going to say. He does have a mean hard flip, though. I give the man credit. And, you know, he, he got a, when I skated with him, he got a kick flip to backside pivot on his mini ramp, which I cannot do. I've never done in my life. So, All credit. Maybe, hopefully, one day I can make it to Tim's show and, and skate his mini ramp. I doubt I ever will. I'm too. It's a fun uh, ramp. It's really great. Super, I'm too antagonistic, but I, I respect him he's a lot. Not, I know. He's not looking some for garbage people. men, Andy. This, uh, you and I are not going on that show. When Scott. he first started his show, he said he wanted to talk to garbage men. So well, don't put it past him. He had Pasoba. No, I shouldn't go there. I got to um, build my clout. <laughs> he said Pasoba, Charlie Kirk yeah. on, so I think he fulfilled that promise. 
Um, Scott, I, I, this might, uh, if you could maybe answer this, uh, I know you're, you're cut on time, but you went on Jocko Wilnick's podcast, yeah. floored me. Okay. Because I'm like, I like Jocko, but I, we know what he is. And then you went on there and you did not pull punches and I did not feel that at all. He was holding back. What was that like? And what was the atmosphere kind of after uh, the conversation? Was he receptive to, um, to, to your conversation? Yeah. Well, look, I mean, overall I give it like an A minus. We got along fine, and um, we got to talk about a bunch of stuff. Um, on his side, the problem was, and I'll blame Daryl for this. Okay. Uh, we shouldn't have set the date until after the book was read. Oh, and gotcha. what happened was we ran out of time. And look, this happened to me a lot of times. It was I'm like in three interview. hours, wasn't it? And huh? It was like three hours. No, but I'm saying we ran out of time before the interview oh, for okay. him to get the book read. Gotcha. So I think he got as far as Iraq War II, and he was like, oh, okay, he learned some things about Iraq War II that we talked about. But that's you really got to get past Iraq War II to Libya and Syria and Iraq War III and Yemen, where now we're fighting on the side of al-Qaeda against the Shiites because we're so mad that we put the Shiites in power in Iraq War II. So now we're trying to make up for that for back in al-Qaeda suicide bombers all over the region and stuff. He, and so let's speak to it. Part. He kind of got it intuitively, though. He kind of knew that already. Just, nah, I noticed he was, no. less, he was no. less vocal if, on the last half of the podcast. Is that why? Uh, Well, I think the last half we started talking more about Russia and stuff like that. Oh. But I think on the terror war stuff, what I'm trying to say is whatever he read that I wrote about Iraq, he probably was like, yep, that's true and bad. But if he had gotten into Libya, Syria, and Yemen, he'd have been throwing the book across the room and yeah. yelling, fuck. That's, that's what, the way the book is written. There comes a point where you say, I can't fucking believe this shit. What? And then it's clear why. You go, why? Because the Israelis hate the Shiites more. That's why. Why does America back al-Qaeda suicide bombers? Because Israel hates the Shiites more. Say it with me. Israel hates the Shiites more. And so America fights on the side of Al-Qaeda suicide bombers in three wars and counting now in a row. And when you get to a certain point through the Syria chapter, you get to the point where now you get it. Now the light bulb goes off and now you understand why there's something to really be upset about here. It's not just that this yeah. isn't working. It's that we are doing the wrong thing. And in fact, we're fighting on the exact wrong side of the war in Libya, in Syria, in Iraq War Three. Well, no, not in Iraq War Three, but and in Yemen. Um, and so I wish I had told Daryl, wait, let's not set the date. Let's make sure that he's finished with the book. That way, when I get there, he'll either love me or he'll hate me, but he'll know exactly what he thinks. Yep. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Either, either he's going to read it and be like, this kid doesn't know what the hell he's talking about, or he's going to read it and he's going to be like, fuck me running. Oh, my God. I can't believe what's been going on here. Right? Those are your two choices. Right? And he would, and he would push me back on something you, that you'd be able you know? to huh? um, have. He would push back then on things he would disagree. I, sure. And that was what, what I was going for yeah. was either – He's going to be like, wow, I learned all this great shit in your book. Let's go over it. Is this really right? Is this really right? Or it's going to be like, wait a minute. You're making a lot of claims here. And I'm not sure this holds up to scrutiny. So let me push buttons and clarify and follow up. That was what I was expecting was like either. Wow. We let's go through this together or bullshit. Let's go through right. this together. Right. And that either way, it would be like a real productive kind of thing. Like, what are we really learning here that matters? Instead, what happened was I was just kind of pushing on a wide open door. Yeah. And he wasn't vouching for what I was saying and saying, yeah, that is right. But he also wasn't saying, no, that's not right. It was just he would say a thing and then I would say a thing. And then oh, he would say a thing and then I would say a thing. But it wasn't really back and forth and really kind of chew over the stuff as much as I wanted. I wanted to leave there with him going, well, God damn, I guess me and everybody else are all a bunch of Ron Paul guys now. Cause what are you going to do? You know what I mean? I wanted it to be that productive yeah, yeah. where it was like, I've, I've really made a change here. We went through the story on the, on the step-by-step -step and I gotcha. 
there's a point in my story where you go, damn, that really is right, isn't it? And I go, yeah, it is. And you go, damn, that ain't right, is it? And I go, no, it's not. You know, and that, you know, that didn't happen. So instead it was like, hi, welcome to my show. You may say whatever you like and we will have a nice time. And then that was, and then it was over. So it was like, okay. And then also, but so then here's the part that's my fault, really. And I should have led with this. This is the part that's really where I fucked up was I was so hell bent on telling my Sunni Shia shit that when he started out with war is killing innocent people, guaranteed, no way to fight one without doing so. So it doesn't mean killing bad guys. It means killing women and children next yes. to who you think might be bad guys. That's what it really means. And then he goes, and it's a government program. So it doesn't work. And the intel is bad and the economic incentives are bad and the whole. So here I'm director of the Libertarian Institute. And instead of saying, yeah, exactly. And just essentially saying, yeah, you took the words right out of my mouth and elaborating on that and talking about all the different economic reasons why war can't work for the same reasons that Hayek explains that central planning can't work when it comes to economic matters at home and all of these things. I didn't do that. Instead, I'm like, no, let's talk about the Sunnis and the Shiites. No, dude, he wants to talk about the economics of war. And I'm not listening, right? I'm like, no, I want to talk about the thing I want to listen to because I'm a fucking idiot. So, so then I, when I listened to it later, it was like, OK, well, one, I really wish I had told Daryl, let's hold off and make sure he reads the yeah. whole book before we do this. And then two, I really wish just like in, a, in my debates with uh, Kushner and Crystal and Young, I, I really need to do a better job of listening to them instead of just waiting to say the thing that I want to say so damn bad because. And, you know, part of my problem is I do smoke so much weed that I'm stupid and I lose my short term memory. So if Charlie I'm thinking Kirk. of something I want to say that I get really impatient because I'm afraid that I'm going to forget it and not be able to figure out where I was anymore or whatever like that. So then I just like want I'm like hell bent on saying the thing I want to say. And then I'm not listening at all. Like, here's this guy talking about if you think about it, central planning doesn't work. So why would it work for the military? Well, this is the most famous Navy SEAL in the world saying this. And instead of saying, ta-da, look, everybody, you know, this is exactly right. And let me count the ways and let me cite the scholars, right? Let me tell you about Robert Higgs. Let me tell you about Justin Raimondo. Let me, right? I just blew it. So they, blew ignore, it. All, I, they I, ignore all the incentives. Right. I, I actually reviewed that podcast. I had it on one of my clip shows that I did, and I played multiple clips. Uh, and maybe I'll link it to this one because I, I think I actually played two of those spots where he has the idea of kind of the, the anarchy and then he pushes back. So he has competing points of view that he presented and I, I played both clips. I thought your uh, non pushing back on him was simply, you know what, we've got a, there's more that we need to have you agree about. This is one aspect that we can just kind of let go because it was not glaring, but I mean, you know, you're you and he well, was and just saying what. You know, and part of it, too, was like, we're just it, it really was my fault. Like he was saying, you know, you go into a war like Iraq and you just don't have the information to do the right yeah. thing. Like I could have just picked that up and agreed with him and ran with that all different ways. But instead, I go, no, -uh, really, they did have all the information. A lot of people did know better. And all the people who did know better and warned were ignored and all this, which is true. But. Like, no, really, I, what I could have said was, look, even the critics didn't really understand the balance of power between Dawa and Skiri and Sadr and the Fadala movement down there in Basra. Never even mind the Sunnis and the Kurds. Now we're just talking about the four major power factions among the Shiites. You think anyone at the State Department, the CIA, really understood that stuff? No, they really didn't. So in other words, no, Jocko was right. And I should have just goddamn agreed with him and talked about that some more instead of saying, no, -uh, because some people did know better and warned because really even the people who did know better and warned, they were not, there are very few, maybe Ramondo was the only one who said, uh oh, watch out for the Supreme Council for Islamic Revolution in Iraq and their leader, Abdul Aziz al-Hakim, right? Nobody knew who that was or very, very few people. There were people who were warning, saying, we don't know what kind of forces we might unleash from Pandora's box. But as far as like really calling it, very few like knew the real detail. So in other words, like here I am 
he's like handing me like total agreement on a golden platter, as the Saudi kings would say. And I'm like batting it away and finding a way to argue with him anyway, instead <laughs> of like really elaborating on how smart he is, because he really was making an absolutely correct point. And this is what Hayek calls the information problem, which is why even for utilitarian reasons, if you believe in the good of humanity at all, you have to have open free markets because central planning can't have, it just is not possible for them to have enough information to make the decisions about what prices should be and what resources should be distributed in which directions. The social you need calculation. markets and prices to do that. And the same reason why militarism doesn't work because yeah. militarism is telling Tommy Franks, go ahead and make Iraq the way I want it to be for me, Tommy. And then he doesn't know the first thing about doing that. All he can do is wreck it. Speaking yeah. of wrecking it, Andy, uh, listen to Scott talk about how he should have argued or, or agreed. That's something for you to take into you when you get married. Okay, so uh, just so you don't have the four divorces <laughs> my, like uh, Tony. <laughs> my what prospects you, you like are to, looking doubtful right now. So <laughs> it'll it'll come to you, Scott. I really appreciate you coming on tonight. Oh, yeah, talking about fun. doing a little bit of libertarian stuff, doing skateboarding. I, I absolutely loved it. Um, I wanted to get you on on a topic that everyone knew, you know, about your stance in Yemen. They didn't know your stance on the skateboard. Goofy or regular? Did we answer that? I'm regular footed. There you go. Uh, Andy, what are right you? Switch. Okay. I, I've got more questions, but I'll leave them unanswered. I really want to know how Raimondo uh, sourced room. his information. And uh, hopefully, Scott, you're not too mad at me for posting that picture of you today to promote the show tonight. So. No, no, it's okay. I know you t- the you rock and roll is better. Um, you know, that feel when your teeth are darker than the concrete is pretty bad. <laughs> Um, but, uh, yeah, no, Ramondo's sourcing is me I go read those columns. I'm the one who put the links in all those columns. Well, how do you get, uh, just, if someone's coming up, how do they get sources? I mean, we're in the information age, obviously, but how do you get reliable sources in, in some of these conflict areas? Infowars. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) probably not. Um, antiwar.com for starters. Um, and then look, just like with anything, even if we're talking about, you know, skateboard industry gossip or whatever, you'd have to have as many different sources as you can and kind of compare them. This I'd guy be willing to go there on foot. This guy keeps getting it right. You know, I mean, you've mentioned Infowars. The guys at Infowars didn't even know what a neoconservative was till like 2007. Yeah. <laughs> um, Antiwar.com is where you go if you want to find out what the hell is going on. Now, how did well, Justin you're... know? I mean, uh, maybe that's a circular argument. Um, when I first started reading Ramondo, my question was, how does this guy know all this stuff? It was amazing how much he understood from San Francisco about what was going on in Washington, D.C. And it was 20 years ago this year. I, be- I got a hashtag going on Twitter, Ramondo 20 years ago where I'm going back and linking his best stuff from 2002, um, including the last one was The Fix is In, which was about Senator Joe Biden's fake hearings in the summer of 2002, where only hawks were allowed to testify about why we need to attack Iraq. Um, I, need to, I need to read more Ramondo. But yeah. I, just Listen, me, take a rainy take Sunday a- if you can find a rainy day around here. Um, and sit, seriously, I mean it. Start in 1999. And just blaze through it as fast as you can. Don't even be careful. Just go fast. Just read everything. Just blaze through from 99 through. And just read Ramondo through, like, at least halfway through Obama or so. You'll probably get bored after that. But Where's the best place to find it? Antiwar.com slash Justin. And by the way, Libertarian Institute, there's great, great stuff there. Scott's got a lot of stuff. Um, And we're going to put out a book of Justin's best, too, coming out probably next year. Andy, you've got a book coming out, right? Monkey Pots, The Life and Times of a Super Spreader. Is that, is that something like that? No, it's published uh, on Trans World. If you want to follow me, just regret every life decision you made. But <laughs> I've been trying to do more stuff on on my Odyssey, and and uh, I'm calling conservatives gay leftists on Twitter. So. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> um, listen, Andy can ride the vert ramp. I've seen him almost do a really nice frontside air a couple of times. So, wow. well, when I first got up there, I dropped in padless and was yeah. ready to rip. And all these guys are like, "Well, what are you doing up there, padless, ready to drop in?" My five-year-old daughter's sitting there right there. Well, at the time, she was four. So, yeah, I don't nah, know, man, that's, you're, 
Yeah. I knew from the beginning, as soon as I saw you skateboard, you got skills, man. You just need practice. I'll um, smoke you. I'll every smoke Sunday you on the day in Austin Vert Dogs. Look me up, man. I'll smoke you on that uh, new pump track, but on the vert ramp, you got me beat. You know what? You did smoke me on the pump track yesterday. I don't <laughs> think that you can really speak in the future tense like that about how it's going to be from here on out. I'm going to clip man. that out of context <laughs> for everyone, anyway. just so you know. Uh, Scott, where can people find you? What what, what do you have coming up? Uh, throw your plugs out here, and then we'll head out. Yeah, man. I'm uh, scotthorton.org for the show, and that's um, – iTunes and Stitcher and Spotify and all those things for the Scott Horton show. Uh, 5,700 something interviews going back to 2003 for you there, which might be a world record. I don't know. Um, Take that. That's all at youtube.com slash Scott Horton show and at odyssey.com slash something slash Scott Horton show, however that works. Um, and then I'm the editorial director of antiwar.com. I'm the director of the Libertarian Institute. And I wrote four books. Fool's Errand, Enough Already, The Great Ron Paul, and the brand new one is Hotter Than the Sun, Time to Abolish Nuclear Weapons. And all that is available at scotthorton.org slash books. I've read Enough Already. I will get on the next ones. Uh, Andy, I appreciate you being on. Scott, uh, it's been a uh, – sorry I didn't mention uh, or meet you in Reno. I was there. You were ranting to other oh, really? people. I'm sorry. I, I was I Next was, time. Next time. It'll be my it'll be my duty. I was so, ranting. I remember that. Yeah, that yeah, did happen. Something once. about cops in a Starbucks and something else. I saw that. Ah, uh, yeah. But we'll, we'll let it be there. I, I appreciate it uh, for, for coming on. And um, hang on. We're going to have an unnecessarily long outro. Thanks, everybody, for joining this, boat, this show. And Andy, see you at the ramp on Sunday. There you go. Okay, I'm leaving now, bye, guys. But she's back. And now. Chick-fil-A is completely overrated. It's not that good. I prefer Zaxby's. I prefer Popeye's. Takes a tough man to make a tender forecast, Nick. And I guess that's me. <laughs> Keep fucking that chicken. For, should I vote for Dick Cheney on the Libertarian Party? Do yes. I have an obligation to vote for Dick Cheney? I would say so. Yes. Well, did it work for those people? <laughs> no, it never does. I mean, these people somehow delude themselves into thinking it might, but... <laughs> but it might work for us. That one dude was like, not a podcast, I can't find it anywhere, and they don't have video. <laughs> oh, yeah, Peter Janky, yeah. He's yeah, a... I blocked him. I'll do it. If he unblocks me, I'll... I'll... <laughs> He'll buy your shirt if you unblock him, Bert. He's a wigger. Yeah, nothing cooler than so a 49-year-old wigger. Like, well, yeah, I just started I live streaming. Cut me some slack. I'm fucking... I'm pretty high-tech for a boomer. Uh, but anyways... For a boomer. I...